good evening ladies and gentlemen to everyone who has stayed on with us through the start you'll had a very engaging discussion on communicating with today's always on customer and uh, we realize how important that is in times like these where consumer is at the core of you know everything that a brand is doing uh, so now taking the evening forward uh, we have our next panel where we're talking about technologies for enhanced customer engagement uh, uh, we're going to have to we're going to be talking about uh, topics which will cover real time user segmentations engaging uh, back lost customers which i think is a very important uh, element and uh, without taking on too much time may i please request sabisachi mitter md of falco to please take the conversation forward thanks michel uh, welcome everyone on the panel i just uh, give a brief introduction of everyone who's here for the benefit of uh, our audience Uh, first on the panel, Pragati. Pragati Basu is uh, head of marketing initiatives at Talkworker across India and parts of Europe. She is an inbound marketing professional with eight years of experience under her belt, having worked at Google, Rocket Internet, and startups both in India and Europe. A digital native is what she claims, and uh, is every part of that. She's always looking out for new ways to generate leads and create magic moments for customers. Welcome on the panel, Pragati. Thank you so much for the introduction. Happy to be here. Next on the panel is Malay. Malay Harsha is a director of marketing at CleverTap with over twelve years of experience in B two B and B two C marketing across SaaS and ed tech startups. Welcome, Malay. Look forward Thank to some you. interesting insights. Uh, yeah, I mean we're really excited about uh, what CleverTap brings to this uh, topic, and uh, hope to hear a lot of your perspectives on that. Happy to be Next here. Next up, Umesh Krishna is director of brand marketing at Swiggy, handling marketing insights, media, and brand management functions at Swiggy. His experience spans automotive and e-commerce, with the past half decade being spent at Ola and Swiggy, seeing through crucial periods of brand building at both these companies. Welcome, Umesh. Hey, uh, thanks for the introduction. Very uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, and we look forward to a lot of insights from Swiggy. I think you will sure. be making lots of money in these times. Uh, <laughs> probably a few businesses uh, which are now shipping everything. I mean, very soon you might be a competitor to Amazon. The way things are going. All right, we'll 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 see about that. Great. Last on the panel, Sonali. Sonali Malavia is a senior vice president, client partner at Essence, a global data and measurement driven company, which is part of Group M. Uh, in her role, she leads the agency's relationship with Google in India and Southeast Asia. She has over 20 years of work experience. So now she's a seasoned marketing professional with specialities including strategic planning, consumer analytics, creative problem solving, and crafting business solutions. That's quite a lot. I wish I had your <laughs> repertoire of expertise. <laughs> so now she's love for building connections uh, between brands and consumers. Has taken us across the world, wide spectrum of industries and geographies, including Twitter, Mindshare, and Roy Morgan Research. Welcome, Sonali. Thanks for the introduction. I think it's it's a bit much now. I know why you asked for a hundred words. Um, <laughs> happy Actually, Sonali, we more to share, more to share in our profile. And I said, I mean, that that will that will be the session. <laughs> right. Happy to Please. be here. Happy to meet my co-panelists, and thanks Exchange for Media for having us here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to a great session. Uh, feel free to uh, interject, add your points of view, disagree with each other. Let's make it as interesting as possible, right? So I'll just set the context uh, before we, you know, sort of uh, hand it over to all of you to share your experience and views. Uh, marketing technology or martech, in whichever way you uh, you know refer to it, is really an option. In mean, last I checked, there are some 7,000 solutions, martech platforms out there. Probably it would take you a year to even understand how many martech platforms are out there across maybe 30 different martech stacks. Uh, many companies, and I think even Swiggy is one of them, have even built some of their own martech stacks. So technology has been around for the last few years. We have talked about AI, ML for the last four years. Um, But I think people now want to know what is really happening with these technologies. We've talked about data. We've talked about programmatic. We've talked about a whole bunch of stuff, and we keep talking about them. Sounds really nice on PowerPoint presentation, but I think today we've got a great panel—a mix of people who are on the martech side and some on the brand side. 
who can I think bring in some perspective about what is really happening with customer engagement, customer experience, and the use of Martech platforms, right? So before we uh, you know sort of get into a discussion, I just thought we will structure it into three stages because the entire stack is so wide that if we just throw it open for the audience, uh, you know, we could be talking in various directions and so what I thought is we we'll split this up into three stages, largely an aggregation of the various customer life cycle stages. Okay, so the first stage is basically where we look at brand, brand building, awareness, preference, uh, how do we bring, build brand love and how does MarTech platforms and technology help doing that? Because if you don't do that, then the further stages of the life cycle really don't kick in. So we'll have a discussion around that and your perspectives uh, with respect to the first stage of the consumer behavior. The second one which I think in today's context is extremely crucial. We were hearing the previous panel also talk about it, ROI, etc., which is the entire acquisition funnel. Martech is today playing a fairly aggressive role in the acquisition space uh, across various technologies. And I think the third stage is, uh, again, in today's context, extremely critical is how do you retain your customer? How do you generate more lifetime value from your customers? How do you prevent churn? How do you re-engage lost customers? So this entire value chain of existing customers and how do you work with them? and how do you build value across the value chain. So before I get into each of these stages and uh, you know, uh, throw questions and uh, thought starters to all of you, maybe all of you can start with just a minute summary okay, about your overall perspective on MarTech and customer engagement and what you feel both from your personal experience on your views with respect to uh, how this is going. So we'll start with you, Pragati, since you're on the top left of the screen. Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so my, my perspective on MarTech is very simple. Uh, marketing is not anymore just about creativity. It's a science, really. So without data, uh, it's it's not going to have the desired effect and the desired impact. So anything that is done in marketing, uh, whatever you see, actually, there are several layers of data behind it today. And uh, without data, uh, you know, like I said, marketing is not going to be efficient. And since ROI, um, like we just heard, it, it's, it's the three magic letters, uh, MarTech is extremely important to, to trace that, to be able to justify further spend, especially in times like today. So uh, it's very, very important, uh, I feel. And uh, looking forward to chatting more about this. I uh, just wanted to add that marketing will get you everywhere if you listen to your customers or consumers and basically give them um, a piece of what they want to hear or uh, fill a need that exists already for them in the market. Thanks, Prakati. Good initial thoughts. I think that was interesting. Creativity is not good to get you to your destination. You need to put some science to it. Uh, quick thoughts, Malay. Uh, I think uh, building on what uh, Prakati just pointed out, yes, it's a fact, whatever uh, marketers practiced in some 10 years ago, that's completely redundant. A lot of marketers in today's world could be really scared and intimidated by what Prakati has just pointed out. There's so much of data. Uh, there's these behemoths of data that rest in the back end. And there are those many markets, marketing tech stacks, uh, the net essence is it needs to be simple and it needs to be simple enough for people to be able to take insights out and actionable insights at that. A lot of data, what it tends to do, and I, uh, this is just old school knowledge, just leads to analysis paralysis and moving forward from that era is important. At the same time, uh, you will find, especially with businesses as we have Umesha, which operate in real time. <laughs> A little prior to real time. So I was speaking to Shobhi Tandon, uh, uh, who heads the dominoes in uh, the Middle Eastern region. And uh, he talked about before your order is actually placed, you've actually made a card payment. My guy is actually on the street because there's a probability basis which we are running these engines. So, and he pointed out uh, Domino's is now a technology company that also offers pizzas. Oh, I think that's where we are. Aren't we all that now? We are all technology companies offering some service. And uh, just to set the context in uh, Malay and Umesh, and I'll come to you, Umesh, for your opening thoughts. I think um, Swiggy is in talks with uh, Malay's company, so the two of you can do some tango over here. I think it's 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 well um, post that stage, and I think we're on um, closure or implementation, actually. Yeah. We are at Excellent. the implementation stage now. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So the hope you can share joint speaker from client and solution partner perspective. We'll come to that later. But my opening thoughts. I mean, a wonderful topic. I think there was when um, anything which is data or marketing technology was treated like backend. You know, it was treated like an execution piece, and your leaders wouldn't even want to hear you, right? Very often, it's there are like certain top line strategies it wouldn't execute on ground, right? Um, luckily, thanks to a lot of technology providers thinking through both from client uh, end and consumer side, I, I think over the past half a decade, especially the solutions are brilliant, right? They speak to each other, they integrate well, um, and I'm delighted to see that um, in the perspective of marketing leadership, now technology stack conversations have started coming back. The share of discussions, you know, maybe three four years back on technology stacks would have. Uh, very very feeble versus now there's that switch people realize uh, how tech is both your strategy and your implementation right without that there is no uh, there is no branding there is no marketing strategy yeah excellent great thoughts Amish. Uh, Sonali quick words right so I think it's up to me now to be the voice of dissent I was hoping for some support somewhere but uh, going back to what Pragati said I think um, while I agree that it's become a lot more of a science, but I think it's also really important that while everybody is suddenly in equal parts intimidated and in awe of MarTech as a concept and, you know, wanting to jump on the bandwagon, a couple of things come up. One, the, the you know, we're at the best place today and we're poised to actually take the most advantage of art and science. Saying that creativity does not play a very important role still, I think would be a disadvantage to our brands, especially since everything is starting to look the same because there is that human intelligence that does power everything we do and does power the technology that we go with. And I think so, so that's one broad thought that, that my head is going into. I think the other one is really important to see that with so many, and, and you just touched on it, Sabya, when you said that, you know, there are more than 7,000 solutions. And I mean, you, anywhere you look, it is the most cluttered space to be in. So more than ever before, it's really important today to know exactly what you're going after and what are the desired outcomes you have, because it's so easy to get intimidated by this world. And MarTech is not cheap. So investing behind the right tools and technology is the single most important thing for us right now. So I think in my head, uh, a marriage of art and science, and we're in the best place ever to actually leverage both, as well as knowing what you're going after rather than jumping headfirst into it. Thanks a lot, Sonali. You just uh, saved my job. Uh, maybe a bit of creativity with science is still relevant. Uh, I was getting a feeling that we should shut shop and let go of the office. But I'll come to you then on the on exactly what you just said. So we let's focus on stage one, which is about building brand, brand love. And uh, you brought in a different point of view that creativity is also important, right? So in your view, creativity and messaging powered by data, how do you see this entire space of creativity now being data powered? If I may use that word, if, if that's the right way to put it across. Or how is messaging now data powered? So, I mean, this, this is something that's really close to my heart and which is why you heard the different voice. Over. But I think the good thing here is that, so, I mean, if I think back, creative agencies were actually the slowest to adopt technology, right? But we've also realized how powerful that technology can actually make make your creative because it isn't a one size fits all solution today, right? It isn't about data and, and analytics today allows us to cut our audiences in many different ways at scale to figure out where these people are, how to target these people. What is the best way to start eliciting a response from these people? And, and, and the intersection of both is actually the most important thing to do. I did touch upon it to say that, um, you know, technology without creativity will have all our messages look exactly the same. And at, at a time when differentiation is so limited with a lot 
lot of brands actually providing the exact same solution, there has to be something that sets it apart. And I think that's where the intersection of both could actually make a big difference. Also in terms of how you infuse or, or how you build relevance into your message comes from a lot of insights that technology powers for you. I'll give you an example of Google Maps. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen that creative. It, it actually has won all the awards that I know of. But I think the most powerful thing about it was our task was to encourage adoption of Google Maps. And it's not today, it's about four years ago when Google Maps was just something that people had and they were intimidated using it. They didn't know where to start. They didn't know what the blue, yellow, red actually meant on Google Maps. At that point, taking signals from both consumer behavior as well as real-time data to say, for example, on the most congested Mumbai roads, what we ended up doing was making it a multi-channel experience and actually putting up large billboards which had real-time powered data to say this is what Google Maps could do for you, which was these, these huge billboards which had real-time maps to say up ahead you will face congestion which will delay your journey by say 45 minutes if you're going on, on to say Carter Road or whatever you, wherever you were going and wherever that road led to. Instead, you could take this detour and it would save you the time. We did that in many places across. And, and I think the power of the messaging was that it was, it was a different way to communicate. It was taking a message. And in the previous panel, they talked about saying, don't disrupt a consumer experience, but become part of that consumer journey. And that's exactly what we did. At a time, the, the consumer was most frustrated with what was going on. A solution was offered to them. And, and the numbers speak, speak for themselves. I mean, we had the biggest uptake possible. And of course, then it was scaled all over India. It was just a trial that we had done in Mumbai, but it was such a big success. And that brings me back to saying that this had everything. This had creativity, this had technology, and the intersection was more, what made it more relevant. Excellent. So I think we all remember those uh, large Google Maps holdings. And uh, it was all over. Raghavati, uh, since you come from an experience of listening to conversations, and I think today, even in the previous panel, we talked about that. One of the Martech stacks that you know, has evolved from just being listening for OIM to listening for insights, you know, product ideas, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, since that's what you do for a living, how do you see uh, consumer insights coming out of conversations being a big part of the, uh, of the uh, brand building and communication part? Sure. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, basically, the biggest thing about uh, consumer insights, especially on social, um, is that the information is all, already out there. So you don't have to do anything extra to get it. So you don't have to do like a survey or a focus group. And our job um, as a tech company or even as marketers is to listen for that information. Um, and, and you'd be surprised at how many uh, insights you can get from it. So just as an example, if you're, uh, if you're a B2B customer or a B2C customer, uh, you kind of, at the end of the day, have similar ways of expressing your opinion. So if you like something at a restaurant, you will say something good about it on TripAdvisor, or if you don't like it, you will say something bad um, on TripAdvisor, Google Reviews, uh, and it'll be the same for B2B on a platform like G2Crowd. So that's where you know you get information out of it, and it's not just about reading a review. So you can look at it with some KPIs um, using maybe uh, whatever tool uh, you know you have at your disposal. It could be it should be some of them are sentiment analysis, engagement. Um, themes, um, then insights from not just text, but also images. Um, and that should be able to give you some really um, actionable insights and you can bucket your consumers according to that. Um, so just as an example, I'd like to share something that, uh, you know, we did a couple of years ago. Uh, we worked with Open Table. It's a consultancy firm based out of Italy. And their challenge was to find uh, the next location for uh, a pizzeria brand in Italy. Uh, it's called Bella and Brava. It's specific to Italy. So the challenge was where can we find um, a place where we'll be successful? And um, how do we do it? Um, you know, is there a way that we could get information out of consumers? So what they did is they used image recognition technology for this. Um, so the way they went about it is they studied like thousands of images based, of pizza, sorry, uh, in Europe. 
because that's where the business is based. And, you know, they were just looking to open in Europe. Um, so they studied thousands of images and uh, they looked at it in terms of also uh, things like sentiment analysis. So how people feel about the image that they've, you know, shared on social media. And, and this is uh, really, um, let's say, insightful because it's unfiltered data. So you're not preparing for what you're posting on social, right? You're just expressing your opinion. And based off of this, um, they were able to shortlist 10 cities and, uh, you know, potential cities where they can kind of open their next outlet. And of course, this was just one of the factors, but it was uh, one of the key factors that they used for selecting their next location. They looked at also some other stuff like supply chain or, you know, logistical issues. And based on this, they were not only able to narrow it down and find a location, they were also able to customize their offering. So this is the part where it comes to uh, just listening to customers and giving them kind of what they want in the restaurant. So they looked at, uh, they were able to identify certain themes like um, vegetarian options or stuff like, um, you know, meat in Italy was important. Um, and across these pictures, they were able to find um, a large concentration of these themes. And they were able to thus tailor their offering accordingly. So they had vegetarian menus. They positioned that themselves with that. Um, and also they were able to show that they're like authentic, um, you know, an authentic Italian brand which in, with ingredients sourced from Italy. So that's just an example of one of the things you can do using uh, con consumer insights. Um, and, and just the fact is that as marketers, it's just our job to listen. Um, so it's, it's kind of easy to do. So that's just one, uh, one of the things you can achieve with this. Excellent, Pragati. Next time I'll be careful when I post a picture of a pizza. I never knew you would, you would take my pizza picture and do so much research on it. <laughs> but that's very interesting, uh, really. But one of the things, you know, which uh, I think brand marketers always look at is the effectiveness of measurement. You know, when we are building a brand, we want to know whatever activities that we're doing, whether we are looking at visa pictures to decide where we want to open a store or we are looking at any form of data or creative. Uh, the effectiveness becomes one of the factors that everyone looks at. So Umesh, I think, is in a business where effectiveness is critical to growth and survival. Uh, I think it's a very cutthroat uh, segment that you're in. So I'm sure you... Uh, have some perspective on this? Sure. Um, uh, definitely a very interesting um, topic. Um, and I, I just want to add on that uh, to something that Prithi was saying. I look at my social media listening tool and even today there are people uh, abusing pineapple toppings on pizzas and that's usually the conversation that we can kind of see. Uh, all right. So uh, coming to food delivery, it's something that is, you know, uh, people relate to a lot. And it's like faith, right? You know, for Indians, food is like faith. Home food is uh, supremely important. And when we are, as a brand, pitching to them, we have to be very careful around how we navigate. Uh, so we could be very creative in our storytelling and we could test it umpteen number of times pre air But uh, it's only when it actually goes out in the market. And let's say people see it through a TikTok versus seeing it through TV versus seeing it through a personal uh, mobile phone. The way people react to it is very different. So... Uh, even if it's a pure play creative execution, uh, we try to uh, get a real-time read in terms of how people are reacting to that creative. And we kind of marry it back to the uh, media uh, deployment of it. So we never think of it as just digital or TV. We try to be omnichannel. Uh, I may use a solution like Sync.io or Sapper to understand who may have had a greater probability of having seen our creative run surveys and get try to get real-time answers in terms of how the creators are performing, right? Are, is it rubbing people the wrong way? Is anything unfunny, funny, etc.? So you may have seen our creators also have a lot of humor, which means that, um, you know, you can't show the same joke. You can't tell the same joke thrice. So you have to be very prudent about not only how people react, but how much are they exposed. So the media metrics are also kind of like measured quite a lot. Uh, now we, um, when it comes to, and something that we fundamentally believe in is that this testing and uh, people could call it, let's say a split ratio test or an EB, uh, it is something that we can even, uh, uh, you know, uh, such tests which are more technical in nature can be even adopted to our uh, CRM systems, for example, you know, uh, or digital channels. So whenever it is not omni-channel, uh, we kind of go towards more, uh, uh, statistically sound methodologies of uh, understanding how it behave, uh, you know, how it has worked out. And we make the marketing stack in a manner such that it is able to uh, 
segment the data quickly, uh, set up the right kind of A-B experiments and are friendly for even an executive to, you know, uh, who's on the platform to understand that, okay, there's a negative reaction and how we can like uh, potentially push the right communication to the right audience. So um, I think one being, uh, one understanding the consumer, how he thinks, both in terms of the creative route and what it means, or how many times is this creative being delivered to the customer? These two are things that we look at from a customer end. Uh, from uh, whenever we set up measurements, the tech and the setup, we always look at how flexible is it for anyone in the system to react and change it, right? And therefore, we make sure that the plans are not written on stone, but we remain flexible to change our uh, media plans and creative mixes as required. Sure. Great. So, that's interesting. Sure. Just uh, are these tech stacks uh, something that's really is is it something like uh, clever? Yeah. No, no. no I, was, I was talking about because uh, there, there's a thread that uh, Umesh mentioned and something very similar that Sonali mentioned. I thought it, I'll take a point and uh, collate those two pieces. So, what Sonali mentioned about was a high degree of creativity. Uh, for Umesh, Umesh's point of view, uh, there has to be a high degree of creativity, but at the fly, on the fly, you should be able to ascertain how things are going and make those changes. There are multiple such uh, tools that are available out there that take what Sonali is doing and marry it to the concept that Umesh is talking about. Uh, there is something, I, I don't know if you guys have used Grammarly. Uh, Grammarly is something that we frequently now use. A lot of students started using it and, and now I think professionally everybody is using it. It helps you define uh, whether the language is right, whether the language is appropriate. Similarly, uh, we recently built something that's a free tool out there for anybody to use. It helps you define the emotion of that conversation. So assuming Sonali had a brilliant idea, but she doesn't know in a times like uh, COVID where she wants to be empathetic but still generate a factor of FOMO, then by this message, it, how do you ascertain it has the right mix of FOMO percentage, let's say 52% and let's imagine Sonali's boss is completely left brain, while Sonali is the right brain mix that comes from an agency. Uh, and, and that's where it becomes very important for you to be able to predict how that behavior is going to be. Uh, having those creators uh, like, uh, like Swiggy, if I may uh, dare so, Amul did a fantastic job in the good old days where the creators were damn neat. You, you would always remember the girl, you would always remember the cricket bat campaign that they ran and on the fly, they would always stay contextual. Like, uh, like Umesh can listen to the pizza topping or there is a world and I belong to the pineapple on the pizza world. So I'm a, I'm a minority here. I get that. But uh, there's a, Thank you. Exactly. Justin Trudeau to, to, uh, is in our party, so that helps. So, the kind of ins for even for those handicapped with a left brain who think with numbers, uh, the stacks today are such that they will help you uh, get over that creative hurdle that a left brain comes with. That's what I wanted to add. No, that's a great perspective. I think. Uh, Creativity or changing creatives on the fly basis, uh, how people are reacting to it is uh, extremely important. I think that's one of the evolutions of creative people that, you know, you don't get married to your own creative and you're able to listen to feedback and be able to change it. I think he's always done a great job. We love your creatives on social. So Nadi, uh, you work a lot with data, right? So if you have to deliver great customer experiences, how do you look at data assisting you in building those uh, customer experiences and customer experience I think Swiggy obviously is one of those apps which uh, you know and uh, this is uh, for you Umesh I was a heavy Zomato user but it's just probably the user experience which shifted me to Swiggy uh, so that's a win on that side so Sonali how do you see this? Okay so um, so two spaces and I think for me both are equally important right now I think, um, and I think when we talk about the, you know, delivering the, so the right analytics and tools to get to the right customer experience, I think what, what we sometimes end up taking for default is performance. 
we do a great job in measuring performance, but I think a lot of times we end up not spending the requisite amount of time at the top of that inverted funnel, uh, pyramid, right? Where we say that, how do you assign the right attribution to what is happening and, uh, and you know, to awareness and preference? A lot of times we spend a lot of energy and effort at the bottom of the funnel. But what drives to that bottom of the funnel is often ignored. And I think we have a lot many tools and it's, it's a very binary way of processing data at the bottom of the funnel. But understanding what's working and what's not working at the top of the funnel can actually be detrimental to what happens to your acquisitions and, and your transactions and, and what people do, which is why I'm really happy to hear what Malay just talked about, which was to say how a consumer is responding and reacting to a piece of communication. And this is not in terms of actions, but how are they feeling about it? And I think that along with multi-level attribution, which is true attribution and, and uh, in, a, in a world where it's not contaminated, because I think we still haven't gotten very far in terms of cleaning up that top of the pyramid kind of measurement solution to figure what's working and what's not working and what touch point is delivering the right kind of response. So that's, that's one space. The other one that often um, a lot of, and, and I think that comes from an old mentality of saying that, you know, you run a campaign, six weeks later, the campaign finishes, another six weeks you take to process what happened and three to four months later, you figure out, hey, this is what happened. By that time, you've not only finished that campaign, but you finish the next one and you're probably at a stage that you can't impact the one that is currently happening. So I think a continuous process of testing and learning has to become part of our DNA if we were to in fact be able to do what Umesh just talked about which is creativity on the fly. Now on what basis do we change our creatives on the fly or on what basis do we decide what is right and what is wrong if we are not getting the right signals at the right time to be able to influence it. Often in our lives we don't have the luxury of a long window and we need to impact it then and there and i think and by then and there i don't mean this instant but the sooner we can i mean we don't have the luxury of six weeks anymore so i think these are both of these things working in tandem would end up actually making even the top of our pyramid which to me is actually extremely critical because getting the right audiences to go through the funnel is actually going to make our um, our campaigns and our marketing a lot more accountable, which is today's ask. And then the right people coming through that funnel also, again, goes back to saying you are building a lot more customer satisfaction because you are able to interact with them in the way that's most relevant and appropriate to them. Great thoughts, Anali. Malu, may I come to you? Uh, you've been with EdTech and uh, you've basically been on the tech stack side as, uh, as I understand it. And currently working with uh, a company, representing a company which is heavily into doing everything with data. And you know, something interesting that I you know, saw on your website is uh, segmentation on the fly. Um, I'm sure a lot of companies can benefit from using all of that analytics, data, et cetera, to be able to deliver great experiences. So stage one, your thoughts on how you, you being a part of the tech stack space, a player in the tech stack, how do you see companies like, let's say, Swiggy or anyone else benefiting from all the solutions which are available on the brand analytics and brand love building space? So I'll not be discussing Swiggy because it is covered under our NDA. Ah. So let's just park <laughs> that aside. <right. laughs> uh, so I'm sure you have other clients. You, you can anonymize and talk about. So, uh, so uh, let us take uh, an example of a food delivery app that is doing remarkably well today in the country. Uh, there are struggles that the country is going through and the whole globe is growing through and uh, that's applicable across the board. But see, uh, there are certain things that I'm, I'm just going to throw here uh, and 
that will just change the way uh, a lot of organizations, uh, digital first organizations as well, uh, have been struggling. So I, I was in the edtech space for the last 10 years. Most of it was web delivery. Thereafter, we started moving to an app based model. Most app based models, especially in uh, apart from the K 12 space, which is kindergarten to 12, uh, the app based model doesn't work because to learn, you need a larger form factor. Uh, because a mobile or a tablet is a consumption device. It's not a creativity de or it's not a creation device. So most of it happened on the web. Uh, the other thing was uh, you, can't you can't expect a user to stay very engaged in the education space. Uh, so you, there are about five people who are here. I'm just going to make an assumption uh, that out of the five of us, say 10% of us or 20% of us were newbies, complete nerds. Uh, into studies, we didn't need a faculty, we didn't need a teacher, our life was sorted any which way, we could have done it even without them. And then there's this larger variety of 70% of the audience, uh, well interested enough because we know the benefits of it, but not motivated enough, uh, not uh, engaged enough, so we did, we didn't do, and accordingly, uh, the behavior changed. And that's just universal behavior. That's what a bell curve is. And then there is this 10% outlier, which lies outside, which a lot of faculties or teachers said, not much is going to happen with this kid. Um, I'm sorry to your parents, but yeah. Those outliers did remarkably well. And that's a different point altogether. We now call them right brains. Uh, but my larger point is this 80% engaging with them. You have to identify that there are segments within each of these. A segment is anything that you can define by nature, by property. Uh, you could do a cohort and but a cohort is basis, a time frame. Uh, CleverTap is a user retention platform. What it does is, so you acquire X number of users who come to your platform or come to your business. It's a digital business. Uh, they come and stay with you. They either land on your page uh, and somebody like an Umesh ensures that they do a login. Uh, but after that, they choose to drop out. Using the segmentation stacks, what you can do is you can predict. If a Pragati came on to my, uh, let's say, Zomato or a Domino's app, I can predict by the next three actions Pragati makes, whether she's going to make a payment on the wallet today or whether she's going to uh, move out of the platform and uninstall. How frequently am I expecting a Pragati to come to me and basis the number of profiles and the segments uh, using the AI engines that we put into play. The machine is able to establish basic behaviors for Pragati. That's what a stack does to you, does for you. Now the creativity part that you want to play with it, wherein a Sonali comes in and gives you these five beautifully crafted messages, which need to go at these three stages to Sonali, depending on a yes or no. And those parts need to be tested even for Sonali because Sonali is not God. She doesn't know before sending out a message that this message is going to work wonders with Pragati. It has worked wonders with a lot of people like Pragati who are the same demographic, same age bracket, same economic, uh, economical bracket, or maybe the same operating system of the phone version that she's using. Basis this, you are able to do drive sub segments. So, okay, Pragati liked, and I'm going to go with pineapple pizza. We were a minority. Let's see if I can convert more. It's a lovely topping. You should definitely try it. Uh, and if she did, can I upsell? or cross sell various other recommendations down to a Pragati, which may make a lot of sense to her. A role with pineapple in it, for example, which only a small subsegment of Pragati is like, and not more. And accordingly also be able to, there's, there's a lot of science that goes behind it. And the most love piece that I love most about in our engagement platform and the kind of stuff that we do for a lot of people is a recency frequency monetization metric. So how recently did Pragati come? How frequently does Pragati come? And how frequently and recently did Pragati make a transaction with us? I'm saying too much of Pragati, don't, don't take it out on me later. Uh, but it could be I'm really good for that much. Trying to some kind of a tie-up between the two of you. Let's say Sabya, Sabya there. <laughs> so how frequently 
I am out of pizza and pineapples. So, assuming a subject comes really frequently but doesn't engage or doesn't transact, he so that means he was a loyalist but is not a champion for me. It's easier for me to move a loyalist to a champion. But assuming Sabya was re- was frequent but has not been recent, then that means Sabya is about to drop off on that three-dimensional matrix for me. Then Sabya is the first person I need to ensure that I'm able to retain. Imagine this Sabya. Every month you are bringing in hundred people onto your platform, and every month, let us say you are losing ninety percent of them in gaming, uh, especially gaming vertical. This happens within the first three hours. The first attri- second attrition round happens within three hours, which means people will just delete your application or will stop interacting with your application for time, and which means you've lost th- these people. Assuming you are able to build those segments and identify in real time what they do, which is where a lot of which is what is the problem with Martech stacks. One thing does great analysis. One thing there is great communication, uh, creativity. You can write messaging. Third piece talks about okay with an API you integrate with X Y and Z you run your communication boss marketing automation tool and the fourth thing tells you what your ROI was and eventually you don't know at the end of the day what truly really happened which was my story in edtech by the time I would reach out to these people they say buddy we moved on this isn't what we want to do because my analysis itself would take these many days and the marketing automation stack folks are going to tell me these many mailers are already scheduled buddy you'll have to wait your turn. Working all of this in real time uh, for somebody like me who did pass out of MBA ten years ago, I kid you not, it was magic. I think uh, that's what it means to a lot of people. It it has changed numbers for Dream Eleven. Who uh, Dream Eleven, if you've heard of, is a customer of ours, and I do have the permission to talk about it. They were able to have a seven x win back campaign wherein. The number of people who churned out of the system, they were able to bring back onto the platform again. And then there are engagement metrics that we did with Hotstar. There are time to live segments. Uh, assuming Swiggy decides to do a sale, but this sale is limited for the next thirty minutes only. Or maybe Domino's had these extra pizzas that it made, and it wants to put out a flash sale on, say, Swiggy, and Swiggy decides to power it. But the only way for it to work is within this thirty-minute window. Anything lesser or anything more is not going to work, and hence scalability and reliability are key. But there's a lot of magic that can happen with these with these stacks with the right set of creativity, of course. And I guess with also the right set of people managing the stacks. Yeah. Sometimes those are white elephants that keep sitting, and you wonder what you really bought them for. Okay, let's move on to stage two. And uh, exchange for media team. If there are any questions, please uh, have them sent across to us. We'll try and take them along the way and not make it into uh, things only that we want to talk about. Uh, coming to you, Mesh, we now move into acquisitions, and I think uh, for a food delivery app, acquisitions will probably be as important as retention, right? So, um, what is your view about acquisitions using programmatic? I mean, everybody talks about we are doing programmatic. Some of the clients when we talk about you do with programmatic or DD three sixty, they say we run video. Uh, is that what uh, you know? Programmatic is all about, or uh, is there something more? And maybe you know the other panelists who have a view on this can also come in in terms of how we are using uh, the tech stack as far as acquisitions are concerned. Sure, I think um, you know acquisition for us at least is something that's of very very high scale, right? And I think uh, all the environments that I've been part of are really really massy applications. Point. It's meant for the general audience, and anyone and everyone could use it and uh, use it every day, right? So, uh, for me, I've always been part of systems where there's a rapid push for scale, right? And when whenever you are all out on scale, especially on performance, uh, you tend to underplay uh, the role that predictive analytics could play. You know, maybe it, obviously you can't segment your audience and go after them, but in your performance space, can you uh, at least use, let's say, a good uh, uh you know like to like audience with the help of the right seeding right can you bring in a bit more customer intelligence to understand who is the one you can you know who is the best for your acquisition um something that 
So that's that's largely the pure play performance side of it. On branding, definitely the uh, importance is that uh, assume you know you're still building the top of the funnel. That means you have to be a relatable brand to the customer. Therefore, the personalization has value. By that, I don't mean uh, you know addressing Sapya or addressing Prakriti or addressing Malai. It's more on uh, understanding what's the kind of uh, person are the user is from and kind of like potentially giving her or him a creative that works for them, right? And now just marrying it back to what Sonali was saying, it's crew, it's key that we uh, build a stack that will help us understand the conversion path. Very often, you go teams work so much in silos that uh, if you ask the company, they have no understanding of conversion paths. Now it's a tough ask for Swiggy because you know obviously it's a such a high engagement category, but and very high volume. But if if it's uh, industries like ed tech or uh, um, luxury buying, you, the conversion path, the value of it will go through the roof, right? So a lot of your um, attempts at uh, performance for acquisition or branding for acquisition could benefit a lot by uh, understanding these aspects and bringing them in, right? Uh, and something that we always did from the beginning is marrying our uh, programmatic platform to the data management solution right away, not only at uh, with the data management friend, but in terms of uh, all the, uh, for example, Google's cloud for marketing solutions, we brought them in so that there's a bit of intelligence uh, and learning that's continuously in process as we run our campaign. Uh, and there, uh, of course, where one should show the willingness is to uh, go talk to your technology partners and ask them for things that the market currently doesn't do for you. Right. Very often we look at a product and see, okay, you know, it doesn't do this. This feature is not available. Therefore, you kind of let it go, right? Versus working with partners very often in betas, giving them that flexibility to experiment and learn could help you bring a lot of these practices into your acquisition and branding. Next piece is uh, just closing in on the conversion analysis piece. Think through how can you carry your exposed audience? Need not be like an ad ID level information, at least on a probabilistic level, the ones whom you know have, have had exposure. How do you carry them over and give it to your remarketing team? In India, I think retargeting teams struggle to show incremental value anyway. So I think any kind of uh, conversion led perspective that you could give them could help them a lot. And then of course, carry it over to your CRM as well as required. So I think that's where we can kind of build a continuity uh, in terms of the consumer funnel. And from our marketing side, we can be more holistic and well integrated in our approach. Great. Uh, questions are coming in, but I think the question that has just come in from Animesh Mishra pertains to the third stage, which is on retention. So we'll take that question. Uh, when we move into the retention piece, but coming to you, Sonali, uh, again, since you are the one who has all the data and the creativity, how does targeting help drive greater response and engagement? Thanks, Abhya. No pressure, right? All the data and all the creativity. Okay. So uh, I think before I start talking about what is critical here, I think I have a big grouse. Knowing how important targeting is, a lot of times marketers still end up doing a only lip service to targeting. And, you know, and, and just skimming the top of the surface when it comes to targeting, especially in the context of today when there is so much technology available to be able to target and segment better. I don't know if we do justice, enough justice, and I, I'm, I'm painting it with a broad picture, but, but still, to a large extent, targeting is largely lip service. And why that bothers me, and I think it bothers everybody if we think hard about it, because everything else follows this stage. Not getting that right messes up everything that you go into next. But that said, I think for me, there are two parts to it, the macro and the micro. And I think often what we end up doing, so so for me, I think acquisition has just become almost synonymous with everything which is lower funnel. I don't know if we stop long enough to say that, is, is it okay to just acquire a user? What happens, what events happen afterwards? And they actually are way more valuable than just getting 
a customer onto your stack or onto your platform or whatever you're you're trying to get them towards are you happy with just acquiring them what happens if they never take action what happens if they uninstall you what happens if they you know they take make one transaction and go away from your life so what are you doing about that i think that to me is a very fundamental question that thinking hard about stage the the funnel does not stop at acquisition in fact that's the starting point of the lower end of the funnel which is critical for you so i think that's one part of it and the second is what machines can do beautifully in terms of targeting effectively we choose to do on our own to a large extent so today google offers a lot of targeting capabilities via uac via ace and it actually helps you beautifully just input assets and i mean assets not creatives to say that you know and then you let the system target according to the right task and that's not just acquisitions but thinking hard about that and thinking about the final outcome that you want before you let the machine do the job that it's actually optimized to do so the point i'm making is today human intervention is actually required more in the macro spaces and the more fundamental spaces of defining the problem defining who you're going after defining the objective and defining what a success metric looks like and then letting machine learning take over and do what it does best so that's kind of where my head is at when it comes to targeting to say don't try and do what the machine can do really effectively instead focus on the more defining aspects of your marketing campaign awesome that's a great insight uh, prakriti a question for you when we uh, talk about roi uh, and since you are in the listening space you can you know figure out what everyone is saying about your brand when we do acquisition campaigns is there some way we can build some kind of an roi linkage between what you listen to and the acquisition campaigns i mean is there some correlation that if you're doing a great job at acquisitions you're also we getting to hear a lot more conversations about your brand how do you see this space sure so um there's actually quite uh, you know one of the basic things that we could do is you can map the spikes in a conversation uh, against let's say your acquisition so let's say you're trying to launch um, maybe a referral program or you know a new tv show or something like this and uh, you know you have a defining hashtag or you have uh, you know just running a simple query for the name of the brand even would uh, would give you an idea of the spikes in conversation for this brand or for whatever whichever tv show or hashtag you choose um and one of the things you can do is you can obviously choose whichever kpi you would like to represent our right can be direct sales it can be new subscriptions it can be um, also subscriptions to your newsletter and then you obviously assign a dollar value to that but mapping um the spikes in conversation um against basically the number of new subscriptions during the same period of time will be a, a very simple uh, way to kind of a simple and basic way to uh, figure out the roi of your efforts so is that budget really worth it is that agency spend really worth it is it um, you know it it just goes beyond taking a conversation or a hashtag or a video uh, to viral levels you know it's it's giving you way more business insights it's telling you whether you can work with these guys again whether your acquisition campaign has uh, really taken off um and and so on and so forth so th- there's a lot of other data that you can in- incorporate into this such as customer feedback data and things like this but at the end of the day one of the biggest things that you can do is basically look at the spike in your conversation or the sentiment for your conversation uh using uh, you know whatever sentiment analysis technology people have the one that we have here is with uh, powered by ai and it's quite accurate so um using that kind of those kinds of metrics or those kinds of approaches uh can be very very helpful to map the roi on uh, just using social great uh so we're running a little late so now this is all your territory uh this is about retention lifetime value crm that's your bread and butter so i'll um, animesh has sent across a question for us and i think uh, you can take that how retention campaign is run today for clients without dmp or cdp in place i think uh, what i'll do is i'll hand it over to you to first talk about retention your perspective on retention crm 
maximization of customer lifetime value how do you win back customers just that's your specialization so we'll talk through this and then maybe you can also handle this uh, question without dmp i guess we can still run retention campaigns without dmp everybody is not ready for a dmp and i'll come to umesh after that uh, we had a conversation about when is the right time to move into such platforms as dmp once you get your first party data in place clean it up and we jump jump into dmp straight away there's a lot we can do without a dmp as well so all yours malay is uh, feel free to share your perspective sure so uh, number 1 uh, for for a lot of people out here who are listening into this the reason why we all of us are talking about retention and it gets so talked about is also because of the propensity of a retained user who's interacted with you once to engage with you the second time is way higher and i'm going to throw this number at you which is from a 2017 study uh, at howard business uh, i'm sure the number may have changed somewhat uh, but hopefully for the better so they have a 65% higher probability to make a purchase with you again if they have purchased once with you before obviously assuming they've had a not bad uh, experience with you which is where an nps comes in very handy uh, which i also see is one of the questions somebody is asked in the chat window yes so you can so so answer both of them to yeah no i i will not try and answer the nps i think i'll stick around with the fact that retention plays in heavy because a it helps you engage build engagement because retention eventually comes from what engagement engagement comes from what exactly what pragati talked about listen to the people give them a very personalized experience so personalization is a word like mi that is loosely thrown everywhere anybody who talk to talks about personalization anybody who talk to talks about ai and ml but the contextualization and from data to insight is the larger piece which is critical uh, a sonali cannot bring the beauty of her creativity to the fore if it is only driven by a chunk and silos of data they need to talk to each other when they talk to each other you know a sonali likes a black scarf only when she is wearing red heels but when she is wearing a red heels is when she prefers a gucci and not a versace and this is the kind of personalization when you engage with a brand is when loyalty is built that loyalty leads to stickiness stickiness for everybody out there is the daily active users divided by the monthly active users which means they engage with your applications at least once in that time window that i have talked about daily as well as monthly is higher your stickiness higher your retention and the way the retention goes up and this is the important piece we i wish i was able to share my screen to show you guys a graph but essentially if this is your y axis and 100 users is what you acquire month on month and assuming month 0 you are at 100 users month 2 you acquire another 100 users but you've lost 90% so where are you at you are at 111 and the way is multiplying it becomes an asymptote a parabolic asymptote but an asymptote nonetheless an asymptote is a curve that approach that never meets the zero line this is a reverse asymptote an asymptote typically falls flat towards the x axis but instead what's happening is every time you have a multiplier of a 0.1 in of retention and hence your number doesn't grow so you will stick at 111.1 111.11 111.111 all the money that you are throwing at acquisition which is which is where the top of the funnel starts it doesn't grow unless you are retaining people so you need to retain more people and at the same time then only should you start investing and in acquiring more users otherwise all that money goes down the drain which is the reason why today growth marketers today's growth marketers and not the ones that passed out of their mba classes with me appreciate retention as much because minus this there is no math in the world where i would be allowed to spend a nickel or a dime that retention is critical and then over a period understanding what a customer lifetime value is from retention comes customer lifetime value for a swiggy i'm a super powerful champion user also i'm in love with swiggy they started out in an area where there was no food delivery and that was the only source of nourishment for a really really long time in back in bangalore 
because i was stationed in uh, jalahalli so that's a that's a off shoot but that's the only so you understand because they nurtured me through and through and they gave me recommendations that made sense to me then is that is the reason why i found value in them and not another platform so i stuck around with them and over a period of time this this monthly incremental or daily incremental value that they get from me is ensuring that they have a champion in play who spends say above 200000 rupees with them every year and accordingly they will be able to identify these are the champions that you want to go after for a referral program so a lot of offshoot comes right through that that starts at the at the beginning of the funnel with engagement and onboarding but then takes you all the way to a retention customer lifetime value and eventually a brand loyalist who will go out there and put and put a great word for you and that dear listener is where nps comes in handy had a food delivery platform given not given me delight i would never be where i am hence all of these things go hand in hand and what we often tend to not talk about is the product experience and a product experience is not just that delivery came on time the guy was clean hygienic of course that's that's the basic hygiene i expect but my interaction with the platform has to have minimal friction points it has to continuously experiment with what i like what i don't like what users in general like and basis that take certain calls it could be a yellow background it works for swiggy maybe it's a red background that works for zomato but they typically have to try out and maybe for female audience it works differently and male audience it works differently and you should have that flexibility within your tech stack to make those demarcations to give that personal experience my two cents there well, i think we are running out of time so maybe one minute to each of you to summarize uh, the discussion and then i can uh, wrap it up if there are more questions we can like with the previous panel take them on linkedin and uh, i'm sure there'll be the questions can be asked on the linkedin post and all of you can feel free to uh, you know respond to them so our audience can get your perspectives there as well so uh, starting with pravati just a quick summary of how you see martech and customer engagement your top two bullet points sure uh, since we're running out of time um, i'll i'll keep this short but i think it's been a really great session over here i've also learned a lot more about retention um, i think the top a uh, point for me would be that acquisition is uh, is pretty redundant without retention uh, so that was really uh, helpful over there and the second thing is um, i'll stick to this but i think it's always going to be a balance between uh, creativity and data that will take us places going forward uh, so those are my top two takeaways from the session and thank you so much again for this uh, really nice moderation of the session thank you pravati you're coming to sonali malay has spoken so extensively just now that i will just come to the last yeah without a pineapple pizza <laughs> so thanks everyone and it was great to find another lover of pineapple pizza but pineapple and pepperoni but anyway besides uh, beside the point um i still so even if i managed to convince one of you that creativity without technology and at the two work really well together i think the art and science is what i'd still like to reinforce and i think the other point is on acquisitions and and defining what that acquisition means and at what stage of acquisition do you want to actually optimize your campaigns towards and target your people towards i think is is something to keep in mind don't just use acquisition as a loose term of of just saying this is what i want to do so i just want to acquire a customer what does that mean for you and for your brand i think it's important to think hard about it so that the subsequent decisions you make actually make sense and great thank question. you for great moderation and and uh, thanks to chief for media for having me here thanks anabi umesh for your quick summary uh, sure sure i think um, great session i think i've also listened to a lot of perspective coming in from specialists across the marketing spectra uh, so quite interesting for me personally as well um, something that i saw was uh, i think something we spoke a lot about i think one is about having the keeping the customer in center and like making sure that you understand him and um, kind of build a stack that will work for your customer and by that obviously you know uh, 
what's the scale of acquisition you need, what's the rate of retention that you need, all of it gets baked in there. And uh, the marriage is what helps. Um, and, and also in the extremely crowded uh, tech market world, um, I think a lot of folks, I think I saw it in some of the questions here as well, is that uh, there is this desperation to go in and, uh, on, and, and onboard every part of the stack. So I think we should also uh, stay connected and stay rooted and be clear that not all of this should, uh, you know, be on, need be onboarded. It's all about the growth stage and uh, then kind of marrying it to your consumer and how creative you want to be and uh, how personalized you want to be and how does it sit in your overall PNL in the end, right? So I think that's largely where I would like summarize. Um, obviously, great connecting with all of you and I saw a great bunch of audience as well. Thanks, Ramesh. Malai. Uh, so to begin with, this is question is for the audience. Can you try naming two sectors that should not work on retention or should definitely not have retention? It is bad for business. Uh, so try feeding that in, into the chat window. From this session, a few things that I would want to summarize upon. These were great learnings for me. The kind of listening that Pragati you've talked about, I think uh, that's, that's homework for me. Uh, Stitching that creativity into tech stacks or the ability for a tech stack to leverage on that creativity and build scale. I think that's very important. Uh, it, it has to be something that we as a product company also need to figure out. Then most importantly, I think it's the experience that throughout the funnel, not, not just MarTech stack, but the product and eventually the delivery that end to deliver is the engagement is truly the engagement that you build with a customer and finally we shouldn't rush into getting everything everything out there in the world far too many shining objects but the roi is important and we should definitely take a look at the total cost of ownership those are my two bets thank you everyone okay let me just try and summarize this uh, in one sentence i think what we are saying is there's creativity on one side there's technology tech stacks on the other side there's data on the other side, there's a consumer in the middle, and we need human intelligence to work all of this out so that we are in a connected world. So we use creativity, we use technology, we use data, draw out insights, and then reach out to our consumers to not only acquire them, but work extreme, extremely hard on retaining as many of them as possible. So uh, great having all of you on the panel. It was really lovely speaking to all of you and getting all your perspectives. And Malay, I'm sure that you're not going to get a single guy who's going to write that they don't need retention unless you're selling drugs or something like that. Uh, so, you know, you're in business. Thank you, everyone. Um, while we couldn't see any of your faces like in a real panel, it's great. I'm sure there were quite a few of you who watched us, and I'm sure this will be available on social media for you to see it uh, later as well. If there are any questions, please feel free to comment on any of the posts, whether on Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or any other places where this is shared, and I'm sure the panel will be more than happy to come and answer your questions. Thank you, everyone, and thank Exchange for Media team, uh, Priyanka, specifically for working over with us over the last uh, week or so to get us here. Uh, and uh, just as an anecdote before I sign off, uh, first time after 90 days that I visited office just to get a clean wall behind me. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it was buddy. a very insightful thank session, you. and thank you for giving your valuable time to us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Have a good weekend. Bye -bye.